My name is Jeff Thielman, and I'm the, uh, a member of the Arlington School Committee. My wife and I have three kids in the Arlington Public Schools, and uh, I'm the chairperson of the High School Building Committee. I'd like to start, the High School Building Committee has been working on this project uh, since 2000 and towards the end of 2016. So we're coming up on three years of working together and I think this is really a labor of love for all of us who are on the committee. Maybe all the members of the committee could stand up and just um, be recognized real fast, just say hello. So this is the, these are some of the members of the 18-person building committee, and we thank them for all of their time uh, on our behalf. Uh, Ted Peluso, member of town meeting, pointed out to me there was a recent survey uh, done by, uh, isn't coming up now, but uh, by a group called Wallet Hub that ranked uh, Arlington's educational system among small cities and towns in America, uh, smaller cities, I guess, right, uh, uh, as sixth in the nation. So uh, we have a good school district, a well-run school district, and a lot to be proud of. And I think that was reflected in the vote that took place in uh, June. Uh, there are 13,000 people participated in the election uh, on the high school building project. About 10,000 voted affirmatively, about 3,000 uh, voted negatively, but they did participate, um, and so about 77% of those who participated supported the project, and uh, I can tell you that that, uh, that level of support from the community was gratifying to all those who have worked on the project and very gratifying to teachers and staff inside the building and certainly to parents who worked hard on that campaign. So to all of you who supported the campaign or didn't support the campaign but participated uh, in one way or the other, we thank you for your support. Um, if you look at the agenda, um, we're going to give you an overview tonight of where we are in this process, uh, talk a little bit about um, the design progress since June. I'll be calling up uh, uh, HMFH's uh, Lori Coles to talk about that part of the project. We're going to talk about uh, value engineering, so the process we go through um, to uh, value engineer, um, and that means kind of stay within the budget. I'll explain that in a minute or explain that a little bit uh, later on. We're going to talk about impact on students and student life in the school, talk about construction uh, timeline and phasing, and then we'll uh, take questions. So I just want to kind of recap uh, a little bit about why we're building a new high school. That's the next slide. So why we're building a new high school. Um, so just as a reminder, oh, I hit the thing? Oh, no, I'm the guy. Oh, okay, I can't even figure that out. Oh, thank you. Ah, great. Um, okay, so just to kind of remind everyone um, of why we're building a new high school. So um, as everyone knows, uh, in 2013, I think everyone knows who has followed this discussion, in 2013, the, the, uh, uh, the New England Association of Schools and Colleges, known as NEASC, uh, came for a visit and uh, did a site visit and in the uh, annual 10-year or every 10-year accreditation visit. And in the course of that visit, they determined that our facilities were not adequate for a high school in the 21st century. And so they put the high school on warning status. Um, we kind of knew that was coming. No one who was involved in the accreditation process, I think, inside the high school, uh, certainly the superintendent, no one was surprised about that given the state of the high school. It's an old facility. Uh, its first, first was built in 1914, the first building was built in 1914, an addition in 1938, and then more uh, construction in 1980. So between 1914 and 1918, there was a lot of construction that created a very confusing layout, and by the time you get to 2013, uh, it's time to build a brand new high school. In addition, um, <clears throat> we, uh, faced, uh, we are facing in the town of Arlington growing enrollment. Uh, when I joined the school committee, which was a while back, we had 4,300 students in the Arlington Public Schools, and today we have more than 6,000 students in the Arlington Public Schools. The, um, uh, <clears throat> the high school enrollment currently is 1,400. We're designing a building for 1,755 students, and by the time we open and are you know, fully open, uh, we're going to be pretty close to that design enrollment number. The building has flexibility to allow for more students, but our enrollment is growing, the building is deteriorating, deteriorating. the accreditation uh, was pretty clear on what we needed to do, and the taxpayers happily responded to that reality by funding a new high school. It's, um, it's important to give a little context to what Arlington High School is all about. Um, it is, 
It is more than a high school. For those of you uh, who have lived in town for a while or have children in the schools, you know um, that the, the high school building houses the Mononomy Preschool, which is a, a preschool for about 150 kids. We're required, the town is required by state law to uh, provide special education services to children beginning at age three, and that prompts the need for a, um, a, pre a preschool. Um, the Lab Collaborative, which is a collaborative of, of towns that provide special education services together, has uh, classrooms and offices there. The Adult Continuing Education Program, or the Arlington Community, Community Education Program, the Arlington Community Education Program uh, is housed in the high school, and uh, there are hundreds of people in that building nearly every night of the week for one continuing ed program or another. Uh, the district offices are in, uh, inside the high school and town offices. The comptroller, the IT, and the facilities department are currently in the high school, though they're going to move out in the new uh, phase of the project. So all of uh, that made for um, a, a, a rather uh, complicated site. It's a, it's a compact site. There's 22 acres upon which we can build a high school and provide uh, athletic facilities and fields. The state standard is 25 acres. It's also a site that has contamination, and there's also a brook running un underneath it. So it's a complex site that we had to wrestle with for quite some time to get it right. Let me talk a little bit about the phases of this project. So after the uh, New England Association and Schools and Colleges paid their visit, gave their report, we submitted a statement of interest to the Massachusetts School Building Authority, which is a quasi-public entity that is uh, designed to partner with cities and towns to provide expertise for building projects, high school building and school building projects, and to provide funding. The first submission wasn't accepted. The second submission in 2015 was, and in 2016, in 2016 we received news that the, that the town had been accepted uh, into a feasibility study process. Between 2017 and 2018, the high school building committee, you met some of the members, um, oversaw uh, the, the process of studying different options for the new high school, and after a lengthy pro process, eight uh, public forums, lots of outreach, lots of listening, we decided that the best thing for the town of Arlington, the best thing financially, the best thing in terms of uh, sustainability, the best thing for our students, the best thing educationally, was to build, build a brand new high school. Uh, between 2018 and 2019, right before the vote, leading up to the June uh, 2019 vote, we were in the schematic design phase. That's when the design became more refined. We got a better sense of cost estimates. And, <coughs> excuse me, we were able to create a building <coughs> that, um, this will pass, uh, <coughs> that's going to cost $290.8 <coughs> million. That's why I have... <coughs> Choking. <laughs> Chump change. <clears throat> so um, when, the, when, the, when the project was approved by the voters, <clears throat> I'm better now, we entered a new phase of construction, a new phase of the process called detailed design, or DD in the trade. In the detailed design phase, um, <clears throat> we are getting a, we are refining the project. We are... Um, getting more specific, more detailed cost estimates because we have more information. And then between 2020 and 2024, we'll begin construction of the new high school. God bless you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> yeah. Hmm. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the construction of the project is scheduled to begin uh, in the spring. We're going to start. You'll, there'll, there'll be excavation happening in the spring. and. Uh, our team has a uh, mitigation expert who will be, uh, mitigation is the right title for her? Yeah, mitigation expert who will be interfacing between the school leadership, between Dr. Jenger and his staff and Dr. Bodie, <coughs> and the construction team so that we do things safely and we have minimal interruption to teaching and learning inside the high school. Um, so, no. Oh. Um, in the uh, detailed design phase uh, process, we hired Consigli Construction. We hired Consigli Construction. You're going to meet the team today. Uh, Todd uh, McCabe and John Lamar from the team are going to speak to you in a, in a few minutes. We hired Consigli Construction because of pricing. We also hired Consigli Construction because uh, they have a lot of experience uh, dealing with 
rather complex high school building projects across the state um, and in working with uh, cities and towns like us and uh, with the Massachusetts School Building Authority. Um, we are <clears throat> in the process of design development as we, uh, as we speak. Um, we are putting things out to bid and uh, we are starting to get, or we will get uh, soon, we'll get estimates back from uh, the people that uh, we're putting bids out to and we're going to get a more specific and a more uh, detailed understanding of the specific costs of the project. And I'll talk about cost in a few minutes. But now I want to call up, ah, I want to call up Lori Coles, our architect from HMFH, who's going to talk to you about the design of the project um, and then uh, talk a little bit about uh, the progress we made in design uh, over the course of the summer. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. Um, so I'm going to start a little high level, but just to give a picture of where we got to in a, in a few brief uh, slides, and then show you the really pretty pictures, which is the fun part, to uh, really show you how the design is shaping up and how the spaces will feel on the inside. So this diagram is called a partee. I know it's a little bit of architect speak, but a partee is just the very simple core of how is this building going to be put together. And so the idea behind it is that we have a central spine, and we have four wings off of it. The first wing here is called STEAM, which is science, technology, engineering, art, and math classrooms. Then there's the humanities ring, wing, which covers all the other classrooms. We have performing arts, which is your auditorium and drama and music and band classrooms. And then the athletics wing, which is your gymnasium, locker rooms, and so on. So we took a long time to come across this diagram and really realize with the educators that this is what works. And it is just a diagram, but you will see in the coming images that it's, it's been flushed out and the, flushed out and the project um, really is coming together. Make sure I can... And so this is a look at it, just zoomed up from the sky, looking down on it. This is Mass Ave, and you can see the four wings. What else is being shown on here, just for reference for everybody, is this dashed outline, which is your existing school building. So again, just to give you a feel for where it is on the site. But it's showing um, one of the main things that we worked hard on was instead of putting, you know, a school unto itself, this is a school within the green. So we've been very fortunate to have the beautiful front green uh, and two uh, going to be very highly programmed and used courtyard spaces, and then all of the fields and, and, and the rest of the site. So that's really the idea of this building is that it's really um, embracing all the open space around it, and really there's very few rooms that you're not getting natural light in the school building. Oops, I keep hitting the wrong side. So this is the overall site plan, and hopefully you all will be able to stick around. We have um, two models of two different scales of the overall site in the back of the, uh, back of the room here today. And in here, again, we have Mass Ave along the edge, and the text here, if you can't read it, I'll go over it, is really hitting the highlight of where things are on the site. So again, the school building, the front green, this is Schuler Court. Schuler Court will connect with a two-way drive over to Millbrook and to Mill Street. We have the outdoor courtyard here, which is called an amphitheater, a second courtyard here, which is really what we're calling the, the learning courtyard or classroom courtyard. And we have parking that happens both to the west and to the east along the drives. We also have parking. We'll have uh, slightly more parking on site um, than what we have now. And we have um, the existing stadium will stay in place. We are reconfiguring the current sports fields. Um, to the west will be a new softball field with an overlay of a football field. And to the west will be a new baseball field with an overlay of a soccer field. And so we will be um, strengthening that partee through the site. So what this means is, you know, there's, an, there's a, a, a real connection through the building from Mass Ave all the way 
to the sports fields. And that connection is really providing um, two main entrances for the school building. You'll see this in some of the diagrams coming forward. And it really shows up very well in the large model that's in the back of the building, which is of this center spine and how it connects through the site. This is a close-up of the front green. And what we're really trying to highlight here, it's something we talked a lot about um, in the spring and last winter, um, was the importance of the existing front green and the existing trees along the front green. So the ones that are circled here are in fact existing trees that will remain. Um, you're seeing uh, an entry plaza right off of Mass Ave, and we are showing um, sort of sidewalk and walkways that will bring the students and visitors into the site from either, you know, the MS, uh, MBTA drop-off over here or over here um, flowing through the site. And it does give a, a little more close-up view of the outdoor amphitheater, which will be used very heavily by the drama program, the music program. They could have movie night there and so on. And then the outdoor courtyard space here, which is connected to from the classroom wings and from the central spine. The great thing about both these spaces in terms of during the school day is that they will have fences and gates. So they'll be secure for the school use. Um, therefore, the educators can feel comfortable about letting the kids out there. They're not going to disappear and wander off to Dunkin' Donuts or something. So that is the overall plan um, close up. And so we have, um, there's two images. This one's here and the second one. These are called axons or axonometrics. And it's trying to give a little more three-dimensionality to the building for, for folks to see. And this one in this case, this is the Mass Ave view here. And what you're seeing is the steam wing, the performing arts wing, the central spine, the humanities wing, the athletics wing, and then um, adjacent to the humanities, humanities wing and connected on two levels are the preschool program, the district preschool, and the district offices. And, you know, this is showing a number of things for folks. I mean, we are going to be uh, heavily using skylights to daylight spaces like the gymnasiums so that, again, during the school day, they don't have to flip on the, the electric lights. They can take advantage of um, the, the uh, natural light. That will happen. And one thing that's not being shown on this, we will be basically covering the roof, roof with photovoltaics. So we just didn't get into the detail of showing every single one, but there'll be a lot of um, what they call PVs, photovoltaics on the roof, um, not unlike the existing school that also has them. And this next view here is sort of taken from the other side and the other corner. So this would be the field side, the drop off and entry. This is the humanities wing, the district preschool on the first two floors and the district offices and then the gymnasiums here. And so it's just giving you an overall feel of the mass of the building. It is a very big building. Square footage wise it's quite similar to the school that you have now except for the difference is the school now has a lot of floors and space kind of hunkered underground without any natural light and so we're trying to avoid that and we do have to um, step down because the site does do that, but we're doing it in a way that we're getting as much natural light as possible into all of those spaces. This is a rendering view of Mass Ave, um, of the school from Mass Ave. Um, so the, the center entry point here, the performing arts wing, which includes the auditorium and um, other music spaces, the four-story classroom wing, which will include, again, the sciences, the arts, and the math classrooms. Um, one thing to point out, if, if you all recall, we are designing a 900-seat auditorium. Again, same number of seats that you have now in the school auditorium, um, but it will be a, a larger, more uh, aptly-sized space in terms of meeting code requirements and accessible seats and all the things that we need. This is a close-up of the uh, main entry showing the uh, colonnade um, covered entryway into the school. Uh, we're also looking at um, site benches and other ways to sort of let people wait for their pickup and things like that. This is a view of the field entry. We're all trying to break the habit of referring to this as the back of the building. 
and it's hard for everybody, but in truth, when all is said and done, this entry will be used as much as the other entry for ease of drop-off, access to the fields, where the parking is, um, and you will see in the diagram that will show how much it really connects right into the center of the building, so it's not like a back door at all. And so the entry here um, is showing the uh, uh, five-story uh, wing of the humanities, and then the lower, uh, it's two floors for the athletics building. Of course, the gymnasiums are, are large, so it looks more like three floors. And then the center point here where entry for entry. And then this is just a, a little snippet of showing um, the more scaled down entry for the preschool. And so we're looking at sort of a theme of bringing nature in and trees and greenery and things like that. Um, to sort of engage the, the younger population there. Um, and what you're seeing here is a lot of different graphic techniques and ways of doing things. Some things are hand-drawn, there are different computer techniques. Again, people respond to things differently, um, so it's just a different way of showing it. But this is a view of the, um, whoops, of the courtyard for the amphitheater. And so it's three-sided. Um, this will actually help with acoustics and create the space. Our theater consultant is in the room if you have any really specific questions. But as an outdoor space, it will be really lovely for people to um, use. The school has lots of ideas of how they're going to use this space in terms of jazz night and movie night and so on. So we are creating a, a stage or a plinth, and it's a very shallow slope. It's not going to be steep like you would see inside the building. It's just more shallow, but it'll give the opportunity for, um, you could have tables and chairs out here. I mean, we've had lots of ideas about how fun it will be to uh, program this space in the future. And this one is the other courtyard, which is, again, more of the learning courtyard, the, um, the uh, classroom space. Um, you're sort of seeing the three sides of it. So again, it is protected and enclosed in that way. It has doors and connections directly to the spine. And what we're doing here, which is a little different than the majority of the building, will be a brick building, a brick schoolhouse. Um, but at this point here, this is, a, this is a, gonna be a heavily traveled um, circulation between the spines. And so the ability that throughout the school day, they can be connecting to outdoors. It's not just sort of a corridor with you know, no sense of where you are, what's happening, what's the weather, or anything like that. Instead, it will have a, a lot of great connection to the outdoor space, to the um, courtyard space. So this is this big section, which if you were here um, last fall, uh, excuse me, last fall and last winter, we had a version of this, and this is the same same, but just evolving as time has gone on. So what happens here is this is the Mass Ave entry, this is the field side entry, and this is all one contiguous space. So when I walk in here, I'm going to be able to see out to the fields. And when I walk in here, I'm going to be able to look up and see towards the Mass Ave entry. And so the real idea of this is orientation. You, if as a visitor you come into the building, you always know where you are. You'll be able to spot where's the auditorium, where's the main gymnasium, and the spaces you might need to get to. Um, again, hopefully you'll have a chance to look at the model, which is at the back of the room, which is of this space. And you'll be able to go at eye level and look right into the space here. And so one of the, one of the more... Um, connective aspects of this is what we're calling a forum stair or forum seating. And there's some views of that in, uh, coming later, but the idea of it, it's not just a flight of stairs, it actually is seat stairs as well. So, so kids can sit there, they can have their lunch, they can, small groups can meet. Um, we're also planning on having um, a, a screen hanging off of this, so again they could watch movies, or if there's too many people um, in the performance and you want to telecast it, you can watch it over there. So it really brings all of the, the big shared spaces um, together um, in this space here. So we have some um, uh, interior views, interior perspectives that have been rendered um, just to give a sense of the scale, the feel of the space, some materiality. Nothing's 
in stone yet. We're still working through with the building committee um, on all of these things. We have, um, as Jeff said, we've got a number of months to go. We won't be finished until September 1 with the drawing documents. I don't want to tease anyone. Not really finished. There's a lot of years of construction, but just for the drawings. Um, so this would be the um, entry side from uh, Mass Ave. So if you come into Mass Ave, you will be uh, in that central spine. You will see the auditorium. You can look up and see where the library learning commons is. And again, it's just a, a, a very welcoming, open, daylit space. And this is one of the two views we have of the auditorium. So unlike your current auditorium, which as I said, it is the same number of seats, we are actually going to have a balcony. So the lower level, which you'll see in a moment, is essentially all accessible. It's a very low slope. And then we're able to have a balcony that will wrap on three sides, sort of like arms, um, which is going to provide a lot of flexibility for what they can do there. They could have you know, somebody playing certain instruments up in those spaces. Um, it just gives a lot of flexibility to the educators for how they want to use the space. And the second view here is coming from that main level. So this would be as if you just walked in off the lobby that we just showed you and came into the space and, and entered from behind here. Um, and I think you can get a sense of sort of how um, gradual the slope is before you would get to the stage. So back out to the main lobby. When you're here, you've just sort of passed the auditorium and you're looking out there would be straight to the field. And we have a couple things I want to point out here. One, on the left-hand side, um, we are repurposing and reusing the stone pieces at the front of Fusco. And if you don't know what Fusco is, Fusco is the building on the left, if you're on Mass Ave looking at, at the school. And so the stone entryway and the pilasters that are there, um, we have sort of sized this wall to be able to accommodate that. Um, and then on the right side here is um, a life skills cafe. It'll be used um, by the school um, for programming. And then the great thing about it is that it can be a spill out during the day um, in terms of lunch. Maybe lunch offerings would happen there. And also um, for intermission or um, you know, between sports or, or theater events and things like that, um, the school is, you know, again, brainstorming all the great things that they can do with this space. So now we've reached sort of the, the spot where you can look down and you can see this is one view of the forum's, forum seating. So there's, there's stairs and then there's seating. And so the seating is seat height. It's maybe three steps worth on each one of these. But there's railings on either side and this is a regular stair. But then it's just expanded to have seating opportunity, gathering opportunity. Um, and then it spills out to the cafeteria below. And then this is a second view of that. This would be looking back at it from the field side. Up there is the lobby and Mass Ave and the Life Skills Cafe. You also can see from this view, is, this is the glass wall that would connect you to that courtyard. Oops, I keep it in the wrong button. Uh, uh, okay. And then another point out here is you're seeing light here. In that classroom courtyard, we actually have a lower courtyard that spills out from the cafeteria. And it's going to be very similar to um, the space that you have now at the high school and that connection. So in nice weather, kids can be outside eating lunch. And just two more, um, three more. This is uh, an example of one of the um, gathering spaces in the academic wings. And so um, nowadays, instead of just having a long, narrow corridor with doors off it and, and no windows to see what's going on and no sense of what's at the end of the corridor, we really don't design schools like that. Instead, we treat the corridor as an opportunity to gather and to use that space and have it be more welcoming and not feel like an endless circulation. As it is, our, co our corridors are not particularly long, but even still, on all of them, we have what we refer to as a breakout space, or in this case, we're calling it the commons. Um, and in that, what you're seeing here is um, a very large light well. And so what it's doing is it's bringing natural light from the roof to all of those floors. 
So all four floors will have natural light in the center of the building. And then we're taking it a step further and um, providing um, just a low sort of counter height um, uh, seating again. So I'm a kid, I've got a backpack, I put it down for a minute, I talk with my friend. It's just another way of using the space. But what happens is all of the classrooms on either side of it have, have windows into the space. So a teacher can send four kids out there to work on a project. And, and they can be feeling very autonomous and grown up, but yet there's a lot of adult eyes on them to see what's going on. So it's just a way to give different um, spaces for kids to learn and to work together. This probably needs no introduction. This is a gymnasium. Um, this essentially is the larger of the gymnasium spaces. It will replace what's currently called the Red Gym. It is larger than the current Red Gym. Uh, in total, this is 16,000 square feet. And we have um, bleacher seating on both sides. This one's pulled out in the image. This one's not for a total of about 2,000 seats. And, uh, and I think I mentioned earlier, we will have skylights along here, so there will be a lot of natural light in the space. But we know not to make natural light that blinds the basketball player or anything, but it's just a more diffuse light in the room. And then this is the last image of the library learning commons, which is, again, very central. It's right in the central spine. It's above that main lobby space when you come in. So that makes it central both in plan and in elevation to be connected to from all of the floors of the classrooms, wings, and bring, it, bring everyone right to the heart of the school. Um, you know, it, it, it is a sort of two-story volume space, and this is allowing us to get a lot of natural light into the room, because even though it's centrally located, it will have a lot of natural light. And I think I'm going to finish there. Um, thank you. Yeah, so I think we're going to stop here, and actually, Laura, I think you have to stand up here, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm, we're going to take about 10 minutes to just ask questions, stop here and take questions about the design while we're on this topic, while it's fresh in people's minds. Sorry about That's that. Okay. <laughs> oh, we got to do the microphones? Yeah, they're, there. they're out there, yeah. So there's some microphones if anyone has any questions. I'll just let you call on people. Yeah. Right. One of my questions was, is there any plan for an indoor track or a track around a space where Where's students can run. I'm sorry. Oh, wait, sitting down. Yeah. Sorry. It's just always, I, it's hard to answer a question when I can't see the face I'm answering it to. Um, so, the, so, yes. So, as long as we're defining it very clearly. So, the gymnasium is sized that there are going to be walking lines all around the gymnasium. So, the bleachers need to be closed you know, not pulled open, and it's a walking track. It's not a running track. Running track requires, you know, it being banked and a certain size and all of that, but we do have multiple lanes that can be walking lanes around. Um, so I'll ask this question because I know lots of people are interested. I know that there's going to be about 100 bike racks, and I was just wondering how many clusters of bike racks. So sort of, I know they'll be in the back, in the front. I mean, are they all in one place, or are they sort of spread out? <clears throat> Spread out. Okay. Um, they're not, yeah, there's not, we're not in stone, but we will have um, bike racks at the Mass Ave side, at the field side, in both directions, yeah. Is uh, town meeting member John Leonard, Precinct 17, uh, as long as we're talking about design of the side of the structure, I placed some pictures on the wall over here of the present exterior, the back of the school that exists right now. I took the liberty of having a mason contractor come down and ask his opinion on how the, this particular part of the school deteriorated. Now, um, most of these pictures up here are basically like three of the walls facing the football field, the baseball field, et cetera. I noticed in the design of the school, the new school, there's gonna be at least 12 brick walls of any manner, shape, or form. Some of these conditions over here, I'll gladly inform anybody who wants to know, but they go anywhere from poor 
stone washing of graffiti off the wall to bad drainage to snow being piled up against walls, et cetera, et cetera, and left there. My question is going to be, by looking at these pictures and looking at the existing walls right now, how are you going to stop things like snow being piled up against new brick walls, water not draining out by, because the weep holes at the base of the walls are plugged up with snow, graffiti that you hire somebody to stonewash the graffiti off of and they do a lousy job. Are we going to be looking at a school later on down the road that is brand new, but after the course of a year with all these problems that I presented up here, mm -hmm. looks like the school has been around for, since the turn of the century. What can you tell us mm -hmm. of how that school is going to be maintained? Mm -hmm. Okay, so a lot of different topics. Um, so in terms of the masonry wall itself, um, it will be very well designed, it will weep as it's supposed to in all you know, we, we know how to design brick walls. My firm's been doing it for 50 years. So I'm not at all concerned about that. In terms of graffiti, which is a really good question, um, and we had the same conversations when we designed Thompson for you all, um, and the decision was made that the first floor, where a kid with a spray can could get to, will be treated so that it's easy to wash off. So that's a process that we would put on the masonry to, to be able to be easily washed off, washed off. But I will add to that, um, again, as I mentioned before, it won't be a back of the school because there'll be a lot of circulation and people there in terms of it's not going to be a free-for-all. But on top of that, we are designing a security system and cameras that will, in fact, show every nook and cranny of the building on the outside and the fields and the site. And so, as the principal and assistant principal sort of say, they might do it once, but they won't do it a second time because they'll get caught. So, what was the other one? Did I miss one? No. Snow? The quick question that I had was, if snow caused damage over here yeah. by being let sit there, in other words, we can't expect the plows to go right up against the building, you're going to have 12 walls at the new high school. Mm -hmm. So, I, I, I gather you're not going to have people going into every single nook and cranny of these 12 walls and taking snow away from the wall so that the weep holes will be able to let the water drain out of it. Yeah. So at the back of the site now, there's some areas that are very tight um, in terms of circulation and everything. So I, I can't speak to what they do now or how they do that, but I can imagine it's probably hard to get the snow away. Um, so in terms of the design of the building, there's, a lot of, there's going to be a lot of pedestrian sidewalks near the building, and so they will have to keep them clear for the pedestrians. So um, the facilities guys are already delving into the length and asking us exactly how many linear feet of sidewalk they're going to have to clear. So a lot of that is what will be along the perimeter of the building, so they'll have to keep them clear. Do you think it'll be a drainage issue? Do we have a drainage issue now in the back of the building? Is that what's causing it? Well, I think the drainage part is he's referring to on the actual facade of the building and how it's designed and that the water is not coming out and it's deteriorating. That's, that's the drainage. But then he's referring to that if you do, I mean, it's like anything, right? So you all, you all know the story at home. Make sure you're not building up snow where there's an exhaust vent. I mean, it's the same idea as that. You shouldn't let it pile up and stay there. So um, you may. It's hard to make the current architect talk about how badly designed the current building is because she hasn't looked at that. But the current building, that back of the building, is significantly under-engineered and under-constructed. It floods back there on a regular basis because of drainage issues. The wall comes straight down to the road. So when you're talking about snow plows, there is no place to push that snow off. And so none of those design issues are likely to be issues in the new building because they're dealing with all of those issues. I could go on for hours about how badly constructed the current building is. Hello. Um, my, is this on? Okay, great. My apologies if I'm asking a question that's been retread a few times over. Um, clearly, the safety of the students is the number one priority, and the staff is the number one priority, and, and the number two close behind it is a great educational environment. 
there are a lot of people in the town who have a lot of affinity for the columns that appear uh, currently in the front of the building. Um, it seems to me that that's an architectural detail that could almost be added to any building if it's done in a tasteful way. I guess my question is, since so many people in the town really love those columns, is, is there a plan to save the columns and to utilize them in the new building? Well, you're right in that it was discussed a lot. It was a very big topic throughout all of our design phase. I'm sorry, I didn't want to start coughing, so I have something in my mouth. And um, so the final outcome of that, um, when, we, when we finished up um, the last phase, was that we are going to save one, maybe two, and place them someplace. We have not finalized with the, with the client, with the building committee, where they will go. Um, there's, a, uh, a, there's a significant cost to these um, columns, and we're not really confident that they're going to hold up. So um, the building committee had made a decision that we're not wholesale keeping all of them and doing anything with them. But the idea that if we find an amenable space, whether it's inside or in the courtyards or things like that, to repurpose a couple of them, that that's being worked on. Yeah. Mm. Adam's reminding me. So another aspect that we've thought a lot about is on the view that I was showing of the courtyard that has the glass, the interior courtyard, but it has that wall of glass. We're also looking at, um, it's called a frit, when you actually put a pattern on the glass of an image. It can be anything. It could be just a graphic or whatever, but it could be an image. And so we're looking at doing um, sort of a drawing of the columns on that glass wall. So that's another aspect of just, again, the memory thereof um, for past generations. Um, I wondered, uh, in, the, in the amphitheater courtyard, um, where you have the stage area, um, have, had there been thought or discussion about having some kind of a um, canopy or the potential for a canopy over that area so that you would, you would be able to have more use of that in inclement weather, et cetera? Um, it may have been mentioned, but it was, hasn't been a cost-effective thing that's part of the project. I mean, it certainly wouldn't stop, like, for a particular event to do a tent, like a tent structure like you would outside, and things like that would be possible, but it's nothing that we're programming into the, the current budget. Hi. Hi. I'm wondering if there are any areas, it's a very big building, and I'm wondering if there are any areas that the design team is particularly excited about, or that are unique to this high school uh, oh God, where to begin? in the state. <laughs> Um, I mean, there's a lot of things we're very excited about. Um, just the whole central spine and the circulation, taking this 22-acre site and really making it all usable and welcoming from all directions, bringing it into that central spine. Again, if you get a chance to look at the model, you'll see how excited we are about it. And really, one of the goals that we worked hard on from the very beginning is to not ever let happen what happens in the school building right now, which is that it's such a circuitous lengths of corridors that they can lose track of kids, right? I mean, it's just such a big building with lots of stairwells, a lot of unsupervised spaces. It's a lot of effort for the school to supervise the building just because of the layout of the building. And what this central spine is going to allow the school to do is Everyone's, on, everyone's going to want to go through there. It's going to be the cool space, right? No matter what floor you're on, they're going to want to be there. And therefore, everyone's going to see each other. So, I mean, the, 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 the quarters that come off of it are not very long. They're all programmed. They all have, you know, eyes on them and spaces that are connected in natural light. And so I just think that the whole diagram that we developed with the building committee and the administrators is really going to make a very connective school that you're always going to know where you are. I think the other, the other hand of this, we've spent a lot of time with Jennifer from the um, community ed program. And, you know, the current building's got a lot of spaces. She can't use some of them because she can't get people to them because they're going to get lost. And now she'll be able to say, oh, see up there? Just take the stairs and it's right there. You know, that kind of thing I think is going to make a big impact. And there's a lot of exciting other program spaces. So I could go on for a while, but yeah, it'd be great.
Thanks, Toby. <laughs> oh, is there another, there's another question? Sure, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I have a question about capacity. So I understand that the school is going to be built for 1,755 students. Um, just given the way the numbers are growing in town, and you know, I come from Thompson, where in six years we went through two constructions. So I I'm know. wondering, <laughs> what, is the, uh, what is the capacity for growth? Because this is going to take five years to grow. By then, will we have reached um, mm -hmm. that number? Yep. Yes, the, the, the school department is very cognizant of that. I think, as you know, um, if you are familiar with Thompson, um, it is a negotiation with the state funding agency to what that number of capacity is. But in truth, they calculate based on 23 students per classroom. So there's a lot of leeway there that you could be 24, 25, you know, the, the number per classroom inherently will allow for growth. That's not like formulated in the way MSBA, excuse me, the state funding agency, Mass School Building Authority fund, uh, calculates it. So I think for that reason, there's a lot of movement. Um, we also ha inherently have a lot of flexible classroom spaces that can be used for a lot of different things, a number of computer um, classrooms, a number of spaces that will allow for differentiated learning and teaching. We have, I mean, talking about one of the interesting spaces, we have the, what's in short called the D-Lab, which is the debate and discourse lab. And that's going to allow, you know, three classrooms worth of kids could be in there. I mean, there's a lot of different spaces that they can do different things. So, um, you know, I think the athletic spaces we have, we have more than right-sized. Uh, performing arts are more than right-sized. Um, the cafeteria, the interesting thing about the cafeteria, because there's so many spaces that the kids could be in, they don't have to just be in the cafeteria space. They can spill outside. They can spill up a floor. They can be on those forum stairs. They could be out in the courtyard. I think, again, the administration sees that there's a lot of elbow room even for that you know, lunchtime period, which usually is a crunch. When you grow, if the room can't grow for lunch, you're in trouble. But now there's all these other spaces that they can choose to. They could say, okay, seniors, you can have lunch here. You know, you can start doing that. So it's tough because you can't overbuild. You can't build for some crazy number that may or may not happen in this town because, again, we are very familiar with adding on to Thompson. But that's our plan. Thanks. Okay. <clears throat> I just had one thing to that. If we uh, back to that. Uh, So if you're looking at the building, I guess, on this side, right? So if, do I have it right? Yeah. Yeah, we, so if, if we had to, um, <clears throat> if we got to a point like we did with the Thompson and the Hardy, first of all, to do an addition would require a vote of the town. Um, there would be a school enrollment task force that would meet and talk about this, and it would be a very public process with lots of dialogue. And it would take place several years from now, five, six, seven, eight years from now. But uh, there is space on the right side in front of the preschool. Um, so if you look at the right side, we could put in uh, additional classrooms, three per floor? Or how many? Yeah. yeah. yeah so we, we could put in 15 classrooms if we had to. Essentially here. Yeah, all right there. Yeah. yeah. At the end, of the, at the, end <laughs> of the steam wing. So not unlike what we planned for in Thompson, just never expected to have to do <laughs> in three years. But it, it is planned for to have an expansion there. And the plus of expanding at this wing is you could be getting sciences and general ed classrooms so that it gives you both spaces and it's all sort of contiguous with, with other spaces. We're very hopeful that will be the problem of another generation of town leaders. Uh, okay. Uh, so... Hang on. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I want to talk a little bit, it's, it's up to me, I guess, to talk a little bit about value engineering. So um, <clears throat> we're engaging right now uh, in a process that we, meaning the Arlington High School Building Committee, is engaging in a process to prepare for value engineering. And basically value engineering um, is, is the process of ensuring that our project and our budget align. The voters have given us about $575 per square foot, uh, a $290.8 million building, and uh, with about $30 million of contingencies in that budget, about 12%, and 
and the building committee's responsibility is to make sure that the project cost uh, and the project itself align. Uh, we can't go above that amount. Uh, to get ready for uh, our first value engineering discussion, which is going to take place in two, over two meetings, we hope we can do, get it done in two meetings, which is November 18th and 19th, Monday the 18th and Tuesday the, the 19th. The public is welcome to come. Um, <clears throat> we have a, a number of subcommittees, a sustainability subcommittee, an exterior subcommittee, an interior subcommittee, a field subcommittee, a memorial subcommittee, um, and there's, I'm probably missing some, uh, but those subcommittees are meeting now and they're going through an exercise of ranking uh, different reductions that we could make in the, in the project in order to be aligned uh, with the cost of the project. So we're engaged in that process. You're going to you'll probably start to hear about it once we get a number, a cost estimate back, um, which will happen in a few weeks. Uh, our subcommittees are preparing for that discussion. And on the 18th and the 19th, before we su submit the, um, uh, a plan to the state, we uh, will go through a process of value engineering. We are required by the contract that we signed, by the contract that the town manager and the superintendent signed uh, with the Massachusetts School Building Authority to do value engineering or cost uh, analysis on a regular basis all the way up until the end of the project, 2024. Um, so it's, a, it's something you're going to hear about. There will be discussions that will take place, um, and we want to make sure that you're aware of that. Um, <clears throat> so Consigli, I'm going to introduce the team from Consigli, John uh, McCabe and John, I mean, Todd McCabe and John Lamar. Did I get that right? Uh, uh, <clears throat> but um, they, uh, you know, the reason, as I said earlier in the discussion, we went through a process, uh, an open bidding process, in which a, a many, many, uh, or several, uh, not many, but several of the large, well-known construction firms in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts bid on this project. Um, and then we had a subcommittee, a selection subcommittee that included members of the building committee, members of the, of the town uh, with experience in this sort of thing, uh, reviewing uh, the presentations, listening to the presentations, and then uh, that subcommittee selected Consigli. Um, and we, we selected Consigli um, because they have a lot of expertise in K-12 educational projects. They've worked on a lot of complex projects on, on compact sites like we have in Arlington. They've been doing this for a long time. Um, and they have experience in innovative phasing approach, meaning uh, experience in, in designing or, or, or implementing a, a, a project like ours in phases while students are in the building. And that was uh, extremely important to us. So I'm going to call these gentlemen up to talk a little bit about the work they're going to do. Um, <clears throat> you press this to go down. That goes down. All right. Good evening, everybody. As Jeff said, my name is Todd McCabe. I am a project executive with Consigli Construction. Um, John Lamar behind me is our senior project manager who is going to be uh, really in charge of the day-to-day -day once we move into construction and is working with me right now in the pre-construction phase, really the planning phase. As Jeff has described, the design development into early uh, enabling and pre-construction. Um, we're the rookies on the team. We joined the team uh, about three months ago and uh, we've been working with, uh, with the architect, uh, HMFH, with Skanska, the OPM, in the town, uh, getting up to speed, really learning, learning what uh, they've been working on for the past uh, year or so. Um, and, uh, and, and now we are in this DD estimate phase right now, which is really putting numbers to the designs that you've seen up on the screen here. So hopefully we'll have uh, some, some good information um, in, the next, uh, in the next month here, several weeks. Uh, I did want to just give a quick uh, uh, description of, of who we are. Jeff talked a little bit about it as to why, uh, why the town of Arlington chose Consigli. Um, we are the second largest CM in, in Massachusetts, construction manager, that is, and we do a significant amount of K-12 through construction, whether it's renovations, new construction, or a combination of both, which, uh, which this really uh, ends up being. Um, we, uh, we, a couple that I would like to highlight is just down the road here at the Winchester High School uh, that John was our senior project manager on, uh, working with, uh, with Skanska as the OPM. Uh, and then John also worked on the city of Methuen, uh, occupied renovation uh, at their high school as well. And then we have, we're just completing uh, the town of Stoughton, Stoughton High School uh, currently. 
and uh, all, all very successful projects, ones that we think um, lend well to the challenges uh, uh, that, we, that we see and that we'll encounter and that we'll plan for here in Arlington. Someone mentioned uh, safety uh, and, uh, of our students and our staff and, and townspeople uh, as, as being the most important, and I, I'd agree. So how do we build this wonderful building, this wonderful new building in, in three or four different phases around not only the occupied school, but the occupied tight uh, project site? Although it's, it's, it's a large uh, uh, land mass, you'll see we'll get into the logistics planning of it all in a few moments here. Uh, with some, some level of detail. It's early in our process, but we're, we're starting to plan that out. Um, and you'll, you'll see where we are during construction relative to the buildings that you're, that you're in, your students are in, your children are in, um, and on the ball fields uh, around us as well. So um, it, is, it is a very um, sophisticated sequencing project that we're, we're working on plans to, to create, uh, I'm sorry, creating plans now to implement uh, in, in really a few short months here. Um, but when we talk about safety and we talk about mitigating impact to the students, uh, we really throw it into, into three buckets. Uh, it's a separation of our construction activities. It's the uh, construction worker management, the, the personnel on site. How do, we, how do we manage that? Because on a job this big, there will be a, a number of people, workers on the site during the day. And then the, which on any project, uh, extremely important is the communication, not only outwards from, from the construction management to, to, to the town and to the school, um, but really from the school to us, understanding what the daily life is of a student, what, when tests are, when MCAS, when, when those different important activities are happening so we can plan those into, into our uh, process as well. Um, so the first here is the separation of construction activities. Very simple, it's, it's creating barriers between our construction zone and the academic student and athletic uh, student zones, okay? How we do that is we establish a perimeter around our project site. You'll see fencing, miles and miles of fencing going around this site, temporary construction fencing to create that separation. We'll build barriers and acoustical barriers more in phase two and three when we actually start to be working adjacent to active student areas. Um, but what we do is we just build a, a, uh, um, a call it a demising wall or a barrier wall that, uh, that allows uh, data, the daily academic activities to happen on this side and for us to be building on this side. Um, and in some cases when we do have the real estate, we like to create a buffer zone which might be a five to 10 foot area on the opposite side of an active construction wall. And we'll get into that phasing um, uh, as we move in a little bit deeper into the project. When we do build walls and we are working adjacent to student and staff areas, we're always testing air, the quality of the air. The, the, uh, we're doing noise tests daily to understand what the construction activities sound like on the other side of the wall. We know what, we know what they are over here. What do they sound like in the student and staff areas? And making sure that we're, that we're working within the, uh, the, the criteria that are established. Um, and if we're not, then we shut down and we have to figure out how to perform that work um, you know, in those acceptable levels. Um, signage is going to be key. Um, you know, there's going to be a lot going on, and people are going to be curious as to what's going on. So, um, so part of the separation is making sure that the students and, and staff know where to be and where not to be, and signage is a big part of that. And we'll work with the school to find the, 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 those locations, the optimal locations, uh, to communicate that and to really to create wayfinding for, uh, for, for people around the school. And then this last piece is strategically performing off-hours work. We can't do everything uh, off-hours, um, but there are elements of the work that we may want to because it's too disruptive uh, for, 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 the, for the students during the academic day, and we'll work uh, with, with the school to figure out when the best time uh, is to do that, when, the best, when I say time, periods during the construction schedule to perform strategic off-hours work. Our second bucket here is the construction worker management. This is um, how we manage our personnel on site. Uh, we talk about a zero tolerance policy, no, no intermingling between students, staff, and our construction workers, unless it's desired from the standpoint of there's an amazing learning opportunity happening outside the school with this construction project. 
Um, we do like to integrate ourselves with the approval of the school into the students' learning, daily learning. Um, uh, on several projects, we've established actually a construction curriculum where we bring professionals from my team into the school and teach about uh, 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 BIM, uh, you know, building information modeling, teach about surveying, teach about different aspects of the construction that's happening right outside their window uh, for, the, for some for the four years they're here. Uh, so it's a real great opportunity that we will look to maximize. Um, obviously we perform uh, background checks on all the personnel on, that are working on site and we'll work with the school to establish a criteria of, of who can be on site and who cannot. And then finally, for, for our staff and for the, the, uh, the staff in the school is identification, badging, um, understanding who is, is who and if they're approved to be on the construction site. Again, we, we work within our confined zones, but uh, parking and there, there will be uh, uh, at times um, people coming to and from the construction site that we just need to make sure are properly identified, know where to be, and know the rules of, of working on, on, on the job site. And then finally, I mentioned communication. Um, you know, we're gonna, be, we're gonna be neighbors. We're gonna be part of your school for the next several years. So us participating in, in daily activities and daily drills, school safety drills, this will become part of our operation as it is yours. We'll be creating monthly updates to make sure that everyone on the team understands where things are from a budget, from schedule, what are hot issues, where are roadblocks, where do we need help with answers so we can keep the project moving forward. Um, we did mention earlier that we've created a mitigation manager position because it's, this is such an active construction site, we need one person that can communicate outwards to the school, uh, uh, meeting with the principals, meeting with the, with this, uh, the staff, uh, and sometimes meeting with select students. Uh, that is the one voice of Consigli that will come out, that information come back, and it helps us to control the messages that are on and off, coming on and off the, the construction site. Uh, and we'll work closely with, obviously, uh, 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 Skansker, our OPM, with that position. And then the last piece, as you'll start to see when we throw the logistics plans up here, um, is construction activities, the deliveries that are going to happen on a daily basis. Major deliveries such as structural steel and concrete to box trucks with duct work and uh, you know, simple construction uh, material that will be happening on a daily basis. We're going to manage that, we're going to control that, um, limit it to times during the day where traffic on site, uh, student traffic on site isn't high. Um, so we can, you know, just again, create that barrier between our construction zone and the students and, st and staff on site. So the final piece that I have, um, and then I'm, we're going to get into logistics plans, is just a very high level look at what the next several years look like uh, for staff and students and, and for you all uh, living in the town. We are talking about starting this construction project in uh, late winter, early spring. February we're identifying of 2020, which we're calling phase one or the enabling phase. John's going to get into the details, but as you can see here, and I think that's on a, a handout in the back of the room, um, our enabling phase is geothermal wells and it's relocating con existing utilities out in that fr front grass area um, uh, adjacent to Mass Ave where phase one of the new building is going to be built um, after we relocate those utilities. Okay, so between the existing school and Mass Ave, that grass area uh, there. Um, that period is about six or seven months. And we'll get into the details a little bit. In phase one, when we start building what they're calling that building out front, the performing arts and STEAM uh, wings, the students will remain in the existing uh, building structure, school structure. We're not impacting anything on the, uh, the ex existing structure in phase one. Phase two, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, is when we start to get a little bit closer to the students uh, and staff. Our phase one building will be built, the brand new STEAM and, and um, uh, performing arts wing will be built and, uh, and we'll move into demolishing one half of the building and then building the new spine, lobby, cafeteria, media center, humanities wing, preschool uh, and the district administration's offices. This is probably the most complex portion of the project um, due to the significant drop in site from the front to the back due to the connectivity of, uh, of the new building the, the, to, the, to the existing uh, structure. Um, 
And it's the most intense from a construction duration standpoint. It's, it's our longest 18, about a, uh, about a year and a half to, to demolish and build. Uh, so very aggressive schedule. That will be done about August of 2023. Um, phase three will begin, that's the gymnasium wing. At this point, the students will be able to move about the, pretty much the entire new school with the exception of the new gym because we're building it. Okay, and that's about a 12, uh, I'm sorry, about a yeah, 12 month project building the new gymnasium and uh, uh, being complete with the project, the new structure by July of 2024. So by the end of that, middle of that summer of 2024 is when the new building will be built. Phase four focuses on taking down the existing um, uh, gymnasium and doing kind of site work out in the back. The, the, the fields on either side of the existing uh, football field will be constructed at that point. So then, very high level, we just ran through the next five years of construction in six minutes. I wish it was that easy. Um, but we are going to talk a little bit, to give you just a little bit more flavor and detail, uh, John's going to come up and, and, and just walk you through some of the major components of the next several phases. Thank you, sir. Good evening. So I'm sure you're all familiar with the school. But at this point, we're just uh, using a Google Earth um, images to map out what we've got here. Um, five years of planning, a lot of planning is going to go into this. So you're going to see, as my presentation here, the first pre-phase, first phase, and second phase, we've got a lot of detail right now. Third and fourth phase, we'll get there. Uh, that doesn't mean we're not there yet. We're not thinking about it, but we are. Um, but these, these are developing. They're evolving. Um, I did hear Laurie say something earlier. Our, our slides aren't as pretty as Laurie's. Um, she's got the nice renderings. We just got Google Earth. So, so just to give everybody a, an overview, obviously the Mass Ave, let me get the button here. Mass Ave entrance, I'm not gonna repeat everything Laurie went through earlier, but that's still the main entrance. You get the Pierce practice field, baseball, softball, and the stadium field. Why I bring that up is because the next slide, I went the wrong way, is we're gonna take the fields offline. We're gonna take the Pierce practice field, baseball, softball field, in order to do, start the pre-work in February, March, April, May, right up until that summer. Um, the reason for that is, as Todd touch, touched on, is that there's a large underground existing storm line that runs through here that we've got to bring down here, skirt past that area that we talked about for the future um, addition, and get that to where the drop-off is down into that area there. So I tend to get into a lot of detail, so I'm going to try to pull myself back here right now and just stay on a higher level, but tell you why we need to get this work started, because that's a lot of work. And for us to be able to start the construction on or about July, that has to be moved. All these utilities have to be moved. So February vacation, on or about then, we're going to take that basketball field uh, court right. Way too much detail. It shut you off already. <laughs> <laughs> I'll speed up. The basketball court is going to come offline, and we're going to make that into parking. Right there. So we're going to make that into parking. There's some islands in that area that we're going to fill in. And somebody mentioned it earlier, and it might have been in Utah, but or parking. We have made sure that the existing parking count that's currently there for staff um, is still going to be present throughout the life of the project. We're not adding any more. We're not taking any more. We've got it down to every stall, where they are, where they were, and how they're going to be. Again, I'm getting into a lot of detail, but that's our phase one zone there. And then right there, the Pierce Field. The Pierce Field, practice field, excuse me, is what we have geothermal wells. The geothermal wells are what the project's gonna be using for heating the HVAC system. And there's a, field, a geothermal field well there, there, and possibly running across the front right here. We're still working through that right now. But those go 500 feet deep in the ground. There's quite a few of them there. We have to start that work in March. The purpose of that you're going to see as I move along here is so we can get that field put in place and get a parking lot established there. So I mentioned the geothermal field for phase two, but we're going to start it in phase one. So when they, sorry about that. When they go from there, they're going to go over there, and then we're going to start constructing a parking lot right here. We also have utilities in those 
areas that I just, on the left side and the right side that we talked about earlier that also have to be brought online and reworked because when we, phase two comes online, when we start demoing phase two, the, the gas and the water lines have to be relocated. Again, too much detail, let me keep going here. So, if you look at the top, on September 1st, when students come back, staff comes back, that parking lot right there is going to be established. That parking lot stays for the life of the project. It's going to be the binder course, and that's where we're going to put staff, right there. We've already got this right here, but you also notice we have temporary entrance. So there'll be a, an alternate entrance. I don't know if that's what we're calling it, Bill and Matt, um, but an alternate entrance. To, students can still come down Millbrook, circle back here, get in there. Students can still come here, and I'm going to talk to you in a second about how they're going to get into the main entrance there. So this is phase one. Starts, it's already started, but students are back in school, and it goes until, for a better explanation, January 1st of 2021. I already talked about everything, didn't I? Okay. So here's, here's just a, a zoomed in image so everybody get a better look at how, how it's working here. This is a drop off, and this is how staff and students will be getting around. So Todd had touched about that earlier. That's where we'll have temporary fencing, if need be light lit walkways to make sure it's not a dark spot so students can get back and forth as well as parents and staff. So phase two, it's, it's not common, but it's not uncommon. We've got this project starting, excuse me, completing phase one at Christmas time, New Year's. Typically, they're summer. So when they end summer, we're bringing the furniture in, moving, getting that building all ready to go for when September or Labor Day starts. So a little unique situation here. So that's going to be all hands on deck for us helping and working with the school to get into that phase one with all the new furnishings and all that material. When they come back on July, excuse me, January 1st, we start, we start the phase two demo. I, I just highlighted right there as well, we also have additional parking there. Again, I touched on the parking that we're constantly making sure we get the parking count. We're constantly adding more parking. So now we've secured the site. We start the demolition. And then Todd had mentioned earlier that this is the first time we are right up against the occupied school, tearing down the existing school, and we're literally, right, existing, existing, new, new, and we're right in the middle there. So that's where all of that items that Todd had talked about, the, the temporary walls, the noise control, sound control, dust control, all of that is being implemented at, pretty much at this point right here. Again, you still got the temporary entrance. I am going to stop for one second before I leave this slide because at January, no, I apologize, I missed the parameter. Um, the swing space for the parameter school, um, the, ki the kindergarten, I apologize, the kindergarten downstairs, that is going to be fitted out from January of 2020 to August of 2020. So when the, those students come back, they will now not be coming back to the school. They will be going to the parameter. The reason why, I'm not sure why that was thought through, but I know what I, selfishly, it's this area right in here. There's a lot going on. I, I apologize. I've got to go back a slide. Right there. See right there? That large line that I mentioned, that storm line, and we're trying to get away from the... Um, the addition, there's a lot of work going on right there, and have, not having those students there is, is, a, is obviously a, a good thing. So, phase two. Can I get there? You put these slides <laughs> I'm going the wrong way. Thanks for telling me. I'm trying to speed up here. Okay, so we talked about phase two. Todd talked about the duration. It's gonna be a turnover in the summertime, so again, we, we mentioned that's a good thing, um, how we turn that back over. There's your temporary entrance still that's maintained through the project. You got your parking lot over at the uh, Pierce Field. But we're also gonna be establishing the Millbrook 
parking lot at that, in that phase. So towards the end of that summer, um, June, July, August, we'll be creating the, uh, the Mill, Millwork, Millbrook Drive parking. This is just a, a zoomed in blow up. So the unique thing here now is again, you get the temporary entrance in the back. You can still come through from the back and you can come in the main entrance for the phase one. But right there that I just highlighted, we're gonna make a connector to be able to go from a temporary connection from phase one to the existing building. Now I'm gonna speed up because now we're getting three years later here and we got a long way to go still. So phase three, as Todd mentioned, um, phase one and two are complete. We still got the space back here and we're in between again on the opposite side. So still butt up against the building. There's a new parking lot that's established. It'll be there for when school starts. And there's our construction zone. Again, I want to highlight this just because we didn't want to gloss over it, that a lot of the um, staging in the construction trailers are going to be in that geothermal well field that, that's highlighted up on the right-hand side throughout the life of the project from phase two and three on. We got the blow up again. Still, you're coming to the main entrance off of Mass Ave. You still get the alternate entrance in the back. Um, we we'll still have to work through some of the logistics about we got construction equipment coming in out of Schuler, but we've got staff parked here and how we, how we work that through. So again, down the road, still working through that plan right now. Oops. There's also another connection right here to be able to have the students and staff be able to connect from the existing building, the gym, into the phase two. Phase four, the last phase, everybody is in the new building, uh, everything is working. We're tearing down the building and creating the uh, athletic fields. So that's where we're all set there. Anybody have any questions on that or? Can you go back to slide two? <laughs> slide two? <laughs> You talked about a mitigation program for the students. How about for the neighbors? Like uh, when Carney built the building by Schuler and Mass Ave, we got inundated with rats. Uh, or do you have any rat mitigation program? And yep. secondly, uh, how about noise mitigation? For the neighbors across the street and in our neighborhood uh, on the other side of Mass Ave, uh, both daytime and at night when you're bringing in stuff for staging. And third is how about parking? Because right now, when between the students, the leader bank, and the other businesses in our area, there's no parking virtually in the neighborhood areas during the day. And it's difficult for some of us to get in and out of our driveways as it is. So the first thing is on the, uh, the uh, we'll call it rodents. Um, the rodent control, we have a program that uh, we hire a third party to come in, set traps around the, uh, the project site, on the project site as well as in the neighborhood. And those are um, checked, if need be, weekly and initially, um, and then as the job progresses, monthly. And there's a, a report of what they find, and if they find some more at a certain bait station, they will increase that to try to um, regulate that from happening. Sometimes it works both ways though. Sometimes the rodents come from outside into the project and sometimes just the project noise and rumblings send them that way. I think your other question was the um, noise. The noise. Um, typically, like any town, we have ordinances that were only alert in certain decibels of noise that can be created. So what we'll do before we start construction we'll do a baseline, a seismic and a noise out on Mass Ave. Uh, we have found a lot of times that like the public bus, uh, the MBTA buses actually create more noise and or um, in some cases uh, vibration than the construction equipment. But so we'll establish a baseline and then what we do is we have protocol and procedure. The one, that mitigation manager we mentioned earlier, one of that responsibilities is to check these um, readings 
to make sure that we're not spiking, and if we are spiking, how do we address it? What was it, or is it an isolated situation? And if it's an isolated situation, we then get creative. Um, there is gonna be pile driving. There is gonna be pile driving. Um, so there are some noisy and vibrating type activities that are going to be occurring here. I'm not, not gonna mince any words with that, that we've gotta address that, but we, we think we do it up front to establish a baseline. There's also, we've worked with Skanska on other projects, the perimeter houses and businesses um, can have a survey done um, with a third party of the existing structure to see how, what shape it's in, document it, so then if something does happen or should happen, it's all there for everybody's protection. And what was the third one? Parking, we're gonna be parking also. So parking is right up there for construction workers are right, right there. Um, that's where we'll end up putting them. And again, we taught, I brought it up three or four times because we're trying very hard to make sure that the current parking spaces that are on site are being maintained and not lost. So exactly what you just said doesn't happen and force people out into the community, into the neighborhood. Um, two, two short things. One is to follow up on the rat issue. I'm hoping there won't be um, poison used. We've had issues with, um, we have a, a lot of red-tailed hawks, other animals, um, had a poisoned rat on my street this week that a hawk almost got, and my neighbor luckily got it away from the hawk before the hawk got poisoned too, but um, so I'm, I'm sure there are guidelines about that. Yes, we'll be working with that third party yeah. consultant to make sure that that's not what we're doing. Okay, the other question I had is about um, the impact on athletics and I don't know if that's something that you can speak to, but what are the plans for um, what, how the athletics that normally take place on those fields will be handled? And I'm thinking particularly of track and field, which actually uses uh, the baseball field for events that cannot be done anywhere else on the site. Yeah, we'll have Dr. Jenger take that. Thanks. I mean, so the honest answer is it's going to be a disruption. Um, we were surprised actually when we found that we were actually moving early or on the spring, but we've already reached out to the Parks and Recs Committee and the scheduling in terms of youth athletics, looking at other fields that we can bring online for um, softball, because right now for us, we don't use our baseball field for our varsity athletics. We use that for JV, um, so they can use other fields on, on site, but our varsity softball field is here. So we're already working on a couple of sites where we would do varsity softball. Um, for for uh, track and field, we're going to have to move people to various different sites and move more of our activities onto the Pierce practice field. And so our athletic director is working through that. We've had multiple meetings with that, and it's going to push and put more pressure out onto other fields in town. <clears throat> yep. Correct. Right. I mean, you, you're, the honest truth is, you're right, and we're making plans to deal with that. Um, not all of them have been worked through, but it's absolutely going to have an impact. Um, I had two questions. The first is about hazmat. How much asbestos and lead paint are you expecting? And how anything in particular you're planning to do to mitigate it and abate it? The second question is, is the heating system going to be a hybrid gas and geothermal or just geothermal? And any other details you have about the mechanical systems? Sure. So the, the hazmat, um, it, as I think Jeff started with, we know this site has a lot of contaminants on it. So we've got exterior, which is in the dirt, and how we handle and mitigate that. And, and as well as inside the building, you mentioned lead and asbestos, most likely. So when we, phase two, I was a good example. The first two months, we're not, you're not gonna see a lot of demolition. You're not gonna see a lot physically happening because we're gonna be in the space under containment, removing all of those materials. And it's strictly, very strictly regulated uh, for OSHA, for worker protection, and that same worker protection obviously goes to the public. So um, it's highly regulated how we manage that, uh, air changes so nothing gets out of that space and then how it's trucked away and how it's shipped away. Uh, that's for both the dirt as well as inside the building. So, so we're learning more about the extent of all of that now in the, in the DD phase. 
um, and, and that information will make its way into the bidding documents. Obviously, there'll be uh, industrial hygienists involved in that and oversight. And, uh, and then from that information, we'll put those plans together as to how we uh, uh, mitigate and abate those, uh, those contaminants or those hazardous materials. And I think you had a question on the geothermal or, or the mechanicals. The mechanicals. So it, I'm going to do my best, Laurie. It's, uh, it, it's all geothermal wells. Uh, there is no, you mentioned gas. The, the only gas that we're going to have is that for phase two that we got to temporarily relocate while we're keeping, excuse me, phase one to phase two while we're keeping that building up occupied. Um, not sure that answers your question. Uh, I'm not far enough into it yet. Yeah. Chill, oh, beam, I'm sorry. chill beam systems. Um, uh, again, this is the desire is to be net zero at the end of the day, a net zero energy building, um, which means more electric, solar panels, uh, no use of carbon uh, fuel gas. Um, the, as, as John said, the only reason we're, we have gas in the project is to keep phase two, and we're, when we're demolishing and start building phase two, is to keep phase three, the existing equipment up and running, and then once that goes, it'll, it'll go away. Yes, two quick questions, if I could, please. You've already pointed out the construction vehicles are going to be in the softball field over there on the right-hand side. Where are the workers' individual vehicles going to be? Same, and same. second of all, we've had We've always heard about many projects being done through the state and things end up missing, like copper and stuff like that there. Will you be providing security 724 for five years on the job site, or is that taken care of by something else? So uh, I can answer uh, both quickly. Uh, the parking for all construction-related vehicles, including um, uh, workers' vehicles, will be in this, in this area here. Up on up on the uh, top right, and uh, regarding um, security, site security. Uh, right now, we don't have that as part of uh, under our purview, 24/7 uh, for the next five years. Um, so we 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 have our construction fence. We have our site security that we will perform during the day or during any um, active times when we are on site. Uh, we will um, illuminate areas uh, when we're not here, but we do not have uh, full service around the clock uh, security details. Uh, we'll, and if, if need be, we can work with the town on, on what that requirement might be and how we could, how we could fulfill it. Uh, during phase two and three, uh, during a demand, Demolition. Are you aware of any contaminants like asbestos? Do we have the test reports on that? Uh, we, just, we, we currently have preliminary test reports. We touched on that earlier. That, that we we know that there's hazardous materials within the piping, insulation, et cetera, and the mastics. So once we understand that better, that's how we determine the duration to remove that. Generally, how successful are projects of this size in keeping on, a, on the time scale that you've laid out, knowing that you don't have a crystal ball? Uh, it's, it's an aggressive schedule. Um, the more we can find out um, regarding the unknowns, the unforeseens, the, those are the issues that really gum up a schedule. Um, I'm doing a kitchen project at my house right now, and I didn't know a, about a lot of the existing uh, electrical behind the wall that has now caused me to reroute a lot of that work. Um, I didn't do a good job on my own pre-construction at my own house, uh, but that is really the... the, uh, the OPM. <laughs> uh, who's my OPM, exactly? Uh, I'm not going to say my wife. Yeah. <laughs> um, but we, we, Consigli has a very good track record of staying on schedule. Um, uh, there are, uh, they don't have a crystal ball. I can't tell you that, yes, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be there. But we understand the requirements and the commitments that the town has. Um, and we need to work uh, constantly. We, we're, we're updating schedules once a week during, uh, during the duration of, of all the phases of the work. Um, obviously, we rely heavily on a large subcontractor workforce to make sure that they're uh, providing the right number of people and the right material. 
Um, so we're policing that on a daily and weekly basis, updating that um, several times a month, uh, and then communicating that uh, out to the uh, to the our, our design and, and town partners. So um, we'll be watching it constantly. Uh, our, our objective is to obviously meet those those uh, those milestones. We have interim milestones along the way that we use as kind of uh, markers to make sure that we're we are on track and if not then we're, we're talking about um, recovery schedules and, and, and start to get strategic on maybe working overtime maybe working Saturdays and, and, and trying to solve those problems our uh, turf and lights still in the project budget for the athletic fields so please so, say yes. So right now, so right now, uh, yes, they're in the design development package that we're that we're pricing. So I was just wondering if there'd be a point of contact for either the community or parents um, who have questions, concerns, things that come up. Is there going to be a single sort of person that yeah. they can talk to, or a single email address, or or some sort of Point of contact. So, so typically the way um, it's set up is that the owner's project manager, uh, Skanska, Jim Burrows here, uh, would be that person um, and the dialogue would go through Jim and then come to us if there are uh, questions regarding construction uh, related issues. So I would imagine we would have that same structure here. And there's the project email as well. Yeah. Uh, but that's a pointer um, obviously with the building committee. Oh, sorry. Uh, yes, the project email building committee. Um, so there's the two routes, and they would come through us, and they'd filter to the project team. We'd like to stay away from putting um, my superintendent's cell phone number on the side of a building, because they get many calls. <laughs> okay. So, um, yeah, so just to reiterate, there's a, on the website, you can go to, what is it, AHS? AHSbuilding.org, but, the web, but there's an email address, and you just uh, send your email. It goes to Skanska, the project management team, uh, they try to <clears throat> answer it right away. If it requires more uh, thought, uh, conversation among members of the committee or the superintendent or the town manager, uh, then that happens. And um, they try to get back fairly quickly. And we get a report every uh, few weeks on all the correspondence that comes in. Um, <clears throat> so, oh, so I want to end... Um, <clears throat> There is a chart. Is that chart in the back? This, it is. So there's a chart in the back. Pick it up. Um, you can take a look at it, but you kind of read across, uh, and it talks about what um, your child's going to experience uh, inside the high school or grandchild is going to experience in inside the high school uh, over the course of the project. If you have a child in third grade or younger or grandchild in third grade or younger, he or she uh, will see a brand new school with everything done, we hope, uh, by the time that, uh, that child walks into school and then you can kind of take a look at uh, what your child's going to experience. So <clears throat> um, we uh, encourage you to stay in touch with us. Come to our meetings. Um, anytime you hear about anything, here we go again. <coughs> Shoot us an email. Give us a call. Send me a lozenge. <laughs> <coughs> and... Uh, We'll answer your questions. Thank you very much. <clears throat> <clears throat>